Lotolan are being really the first FDA approved treatment for specifically demodex blepharitis. We haven't had a treatment that was FDA approved. So we'd struggle and kind of go around it and deal with uh, other treatment options uh, that were not as effective, like the lid scrubs or treating a dry eye disease, but not really treating the baseline issue, which was the demodex blepharitis. Now we have this that's FDA approved. Two large studies, Saturn 1 and Saturn 2, uh, these were the pivotal phase 2B3 uh, trials that um, looked at a large group of patients with demodex blepharitis. And they found when they did it sort of a combined uh, pivotal data analysis, they found that um, in terms of complete cholerate cure, they had uh, 50% in the treatment arm versus 10% in the vehicle arm, where basically patients mm. had zero to uh, one cholerate. Um, but when they looked beyond that, a clinically meaningful cholerate cure, meaning patients had... Um, uh, clinically grade zero or one in terms of cholera uh, burden, they the treatment was as high as 85% in the treatment arm versus 28% in the vehicle arm. So a really dramatic impact of cleaning out those lashes with a six-week uh, treatment twice uh, daily. Um, remember, this is a neurotoxin. Lotolaner is a neurotoxin for the mites, and it's very, very safe for mammalian cells. And so on the other end, their safety uh, was wonderful, but essentially it was generally uh, safe, well-tolerated, um, and that's because really the treatment is aimed at the mites themselves. Very high mite eradication rate versus vehicle. All of these reach statistical significance. Um, and lid erythema, or basically redness of the eyelids, was also statistically uh, significantly improved in the treatment versus the vehicle arms. So really um, effective in these uh, two pivotal trials very safe and generally well tolerated. And we'll, once our patient comes on board, we'll get a patient perspective on tolerance. Uh, but maybe I'll ask Derek here, you've seen some of these patients back in your clinic. They report to you, you know, how they're doing. What have you been hearing? Well, you know, for the past few years, we've really focused on managing ocular surface disease, especially before surgery, cataract surgery. And we've had patients that have not have treatment for their uh, for their ocular surface disease and not had success, success. So with this, patients are coming in, you know, five to six weeks later for a, a, a surface check and their complaints are less. They feel better. You know, they notice the difference. You know, we talk about, you know, in medicine, you know, if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. If you don't feel it, it doesn't exist. In this situation, they see it and they feel it. Um, So their complaints are much less. So we definitely notice the difference. No, I, I have to agree. I, I'm seeing these patients back now, and I am so pleasantly surprised that patients that I'd been struggling with for years, um, you know, and I had said, okay, wait, something is coming, something is coming, finally got them treated um, with Lotolaner, and it wipes them out. And as Eric mentioned, you know, the follow-up study looking out uh, about a year in the Saturn I um, patients saw that even after a year, the majority of patients, there was a statistically significant, uh, you know, versus vehicle that they were still had significant treatment effect and benefit, even out a year. So, you know, these patients may require a six week treatment. And that might be good for at least a year, maybe longer, you know, patient to patient variable, but it, we've never had anything like this. So it's so, so impactful. Um, Eric, what are your thoughts now in terms of uh, access, prior authorization requirements? How has the access been for you in your clinic? Well, one of the very uh, dramatic aspects about the launch of Lodeliner, and that really, um, you have to say, Peltarsis, they've done a great job of working with the payers, is that we generally have real problems when you launch a new drug in a new category and by using specialty pharmacies, we've had very great success in having our patients have access to this very important drug. And um, I think that really is a testimonial to uh, industry payers and clinicians working together for the common good of our patients. 
So uh, we've been very pleased. We've used specialty pharmacies. Um, they have taken the burden out of the office and our staff is not overwhelmed with callbacks and the patients are getting the drug in a timely manner. So uh, this is one of the more effective, maybe the most effective launch that I've seen in my career on a new drug in a new category. You know, I, I have to agree with that. I couldn't agree more. I've been in this space now for 20 years and I've seen a lot of launch of a lot of medications. And this has single-handedly been the easiest one for our staff. Um, I am the primary person for prior authorizations in our practice, and um, it is not a burden by any means. There are many medications that take sometimes weeks to get approval, but in this situation with the specialty pharmacy network, um, it has really been one of the easiest medications to get approved for our patients. Well, that's, I would say that's, uh, that is great to hear from your perspective. Uh, I, I would imagine there are some payers, and I've seen this, that are, that are not covering we're providing access to this drug. So I think it goes back to to continue that and to build on what you're saying and hopefully have access on a, on a broader level. I just reiterate, I think there's still an opportunity to educate. Um, I agree. You, know, you know, this is new. We don't know about it. And so, you know, just reiterate, it would be, you know, what are the clinical consequences? Again, this isn't cosmetic. The, if, you know, what are the, the actually ocular complications of not treating this? And then as uh, Dr. Donenfeld said, probably understanding, you know, the total cost of care perspective, and that's where maybe they could do some work, you know, uh, if, if we could understand, you know, how much of dry eye is actually being caused by this versus something else. And if, if there's medical offsets or drug offsets and all of that, I think that would help. But if you better, you know, again, it sounds like, unfortunately, it's probably the minority of, uh, of payers. Yeah, that's a great point, though. And again, what, you know, Eric led off with, but that you just emphasized, I, I'm a surprised how many people over the years uh, have been treated for dry eye for five, 10, I mean, a decade. Uh, and the inflammation gets a little control, so they keep going with it, but it was never the cause. It was it was demodex blepharitis. And then you you put them on Xdemby, and all of a sudden their eyes feel better than they ever have. And it, it wasn't really a dry eye disease, but because the symptoms are so similar, um, and there probably is some meibomian gland damage, which would give you an evaporative form of dry eye, or at least meibomian gland dysfunction. It's not surprising that uh, those would get confused, but it is uh, surprising how often that happened in, in the last, let's say, 10 or 15 years. Yeah, I might want to ask, Jeff, you know, what what is the reasoning behind prior authorization requirements and, and really what is appropriate and reasonable? Well, yeah, that's you just said it. I mean, the 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 argument for a prior authorization is "quote unquote" appropriate utilization. So, you know, obviously, it, it really is a value prop. And you know, I mean, also not to go down a rabbit hole, but you know, understanding who actually pays for things. You know, it really is the employer, the health plan. You know, and you know, and they're they're really struggling with affordability and accessibility right now, just given all the specialty meds and everything else that's going on, weight loss and cell therapies and gene therapies and affordability is an issue for most people who are paying for insurance. So, I'll, you know, off my soapbox, uh, you know, the reason for a prior auth would be to, again, quote unquote, ensure appropriate utilization, but those things can be mitigated by, again, understanding what the clinical consequences are and all of the things I've, I've said not to be repetitive. And so I think the concern though, is that, uh, you know, this is very prevalent. Uh, you we're talking about the majority of patients potentially that actually have this and a relatively expensive medication and just, uh, you know, what that would do to, uh, you know, budget impact and, and those types of things. But again, with it, with education and some of this total cost of care approach and other things uh, that can be mitigated. No, but when, when we talk about affordability, we ask off to look back to all the treatments the patients have had before yeah. this problem came out. For sure. And still on many of these treatments. And again, um, I, I just don't think that's well understood. And so yeah. that's... Uh, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I don't think anybody talked about this on our side prior to XDMB being approved. And so it's there's a learning curve. And, uh, you know, hopefully that, uh, you know, as, as we get more information and learn more about it, then some of these, you know, potential issues go away. It's encouraging to hear that you haven't had a lot of barriers, but that's just it. We don't, we don't, again, we, we had no idea that dry eye was being caused by this as an example. Um, and, you know, we just look at a, you know, a, an expensive medication in 70% of the population. And we have employers, you know, kind of going, Oh no. Well, you know, it's also not often that a, a pharmaceutical company sets an algorithm for us, which like Tarsus has. So that's not often. So that's been a big benefit in the practice and for the physicians. Yeah. I think they've made it easy on multiple fronts uh, with the education, with a, you know, an algorithm and with uh, improving patient access 
Um, so that's that's been pleasant. And then using a specialty pharmacy, which really helps mitigate a lot of the authorization issues. Oh, yeah. Yes. And also, you know, interesting, the algorithm, they, they really got to give them credit. I mean, people on this call are known for this subspecialty. I've been doing this for 27 years. You think I have, you know, the, part of the reason I didn't have success is I didn't know with IPL and other treatments to go six weeks. Now, of course, you know, that's a very expensive treatment. It was Tarsus who figured that out, who realized there's two life cycles. There's the eggs and the nits. And that's important because many patients will feel so good after a week or two of ex-Dembi that they'll want to quit. And I can tell you from my experience over the years and anybody that's called like Marjan or Eric or Derek, all of us have done a lot of this, it comes right back. So even the algorithm of the duration uh, got to credit the company with because it's made a big difference in the successful outcomes.